morning. Our scripture reading is from the book of Exodus, chapter 34, verses 30, 29 to 35. The radiant face of Moses. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant, and they were afraid to come near him. <clears throat> but, when, but Moses called to them. So Aaron and all the leaders of the community came back to him, and he spoke to them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near him, and he gave them all the commands the Lord had given him on Mount Sinai. When Moses finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his head. But whenever he entered the Lord's presence to speak with him, he removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what had been commanded, they saw that his face was radiant. Then Moses would put the veil back over his face until he went in to speak with the Lord. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you. Now, I, I want to, <clears throat> to begin by asking us a question. Uh, have you ever seen somebody who is excited about something and they don't need to tell you that they are excited, but you can just see it by looking at them? Have you ever had that experience? Uh, it's the kind of experience that we see in sportsmen after scoring a goal or a try. Uh, when you look uh, into the person's face, you can see something, uh, something of a glow that is with them. And that is what we're going to be talking about this morning, the kind of radiance that lights up in somebody's face because of something that is deep within them and drives them. And so some people prefer to call this radiance uh, the glory of God, other people prefer to call it a shining face. Other people prefer to call it a glow. Uh, but this morning we're going to try to call it a fire on a person's face. That there's fire that sparks in a person's face. In the past two weeks we have been journeying together with Moses uh, as we were journeying to light with Moses. This uh, was in a way preparing us for today. It was preparing us for this Sunday, which is known to us as the Covenant Renewal Service. And at the burning bush in the first week of this series, at the burning bush, Moses was exposed to God's helping hand in times of difficulty. And last week, Ian spoke to us about the pillar of light, which is a reminder that the light of God's presence will never abandon us in the dark moments of our lives. And so today, as we prepare to renew our covenant with God, we are reminded that the light of God can shine even through us. That the light of God can shine even through us. In other words, the light of God can shine through me, and the light of God can shine through you and as the light of God shines through us people who come into contact with us or people who see us should be able to see something of that light of God shining through us in the case of Moses it came as a face on fire in, ca in the case of sportsmen it is normally that thing in their face when you look at them after scoring a try or a goal that passion and that excitement that you can see when you look at them. There is something about encountering God that makes our, light, our, our faces to lit up and to shine. There is something about being in the presence of God and knowing God and being in a relationship with God that makes us to have these faces which are shiny faces. But before we get there, just to give you a little bit of a historical background to this book of Exodus. The book of Exodus tells us how God took pity on the Israelites and the means 
through which God then chose to liberate this nation from the Egyptians and their consequent journeys in the wilderness. That is what the book of Exodus is all about. And so the story begins after the Israelites have been in Egypt for several generations and a new pharaoh comes to the throne who is threatened by the number of foreigners in this land. Something that might sound familiar to some of us, uh, that there are leaders who get threatened by a number of foreigners in their land. And the same happened with this pharaoh, that he got threatened by the number of foreigners in his land. And then he took very hard measures to subdue them and to stop them from multiplying even further. Again, in the book of Exodus, we read of the call of Moses by God at the burning bush, the confrontations with the Pharaoh and his wise men, the subsequent release and flight of the Israelites from Egypt into an unknown place, but a place in which God calls them to go into. The most important event in this book of Exodus is the revelation of God to Moses and God actually giving the law to the people through Moses. And so the covenant set up here is a conditional covenant. It is a covenant which has conditions as God establishes a relationship with this new nation that God is about to form and to do wonderful things with. God begins by setting up a covenant with them. And as part of that covenant, the people then are asked to make certain promises to God. And so if you go and read Exodus chapter 19, you will see or you will hear that as God makes the covenant with them, God goes and God says to them, if you do this, then you shall be my people. And so God sets the terms and conditions of this relationship. Now the purpose of this book is to show how God chose Israel, how God gave them leaders and the law in order for them to be his people. Conditions and expectations were attached to this relationship. And so the worship practices that we read in when we read the book of Exodus were to help them to stay in a covenantal relationship with God. But Exodus does something else again. It demonstrates how the people became unfaithful to God and how the people broke their part of the covenant. The book of Exodus is especially important because of the giving of the law at Mount Sinai, which is central to the faith of the Jewish people. Now, after the people had received detailed instructions about how to build the tabernacle and what the priest had to wear and to do, Moses had then received the two tablets of testimony that we have read about this morning. When Moses came down from the mountain, he saw the people's unfaithfulness in building an idol of gold. And the writer of Exodus tells us that as Moses came down and he saw what the people were doing, his heart was torn. His heart was torn as he saw the unfaithfulness of the people. And so Moses does what human beings do. Moses takes the two tablets and smashes them to the ground as a reaction to what he sees as something which uh, is unfaithfulness to God. And then God, the gracious God, because that's the character and nature of our God. Then God speaks to Moses or God talks to Moses. And God tells Moses to go into a land in which that God will provide. But uh, before they can go into that land, Moses then builds a tent of meeting for those who wish to seek God, for those who wish 
to restore their relationship with God. Now that is Exodus chapter 33. And then in the beginning of Exodus chapter 34 then, Moses ascends the mountain once more to meet with God. And as Moses goes back to the mountain to meet with God, the gracious nature of God becomes apparent again as the covenant which was now broken by the people's unfaithfulness gets renewed because ours is a God who searches and goes after us. Ours is a God who remains faithful even in times when we have become unfaithful to God. And so then the covenant is renewed. Moses is commanded to write down the words and remains with God on the mountain, this time around for 40 days and for 40 nights. And then after the 40 days, as Moses now descends from the mountain, he descends with something different that is noticed by the people. His face is radiant. He descends the mountain with a face on fire. It is almost as if spending 40 days and 40 nights with God has done something to Moses. And it is not just an inward thing, but it is something that began inward, but it is now showing in the face of Moses. Now there is something significant with the fact that as Moses comes back from the mountain, he comes back with a face on fire. You remember Moses' first encounter with God at the burning bush, that there was a fire there somewhere. And now God confirms again God's faithfulness to Moses in that as Moses descends from the mountain, Moses now does not only have an image of a burning bush in his head, but his face actually gives testimony to the fire of God. And so he descends the mountain with his face on fire. He descends with something very different. He descends with a shiny face. He descends with a glowing face because there has been transfiguration that has happened in the mountain. Now, the transfiguration refers to the effect of the presence of God on the face of Moses which now is radiant, which is a face on fire. Now, this face on fire or this radiance causes fear in Aaron and the people who see Moses as Moses descends from the mountain. But there is something else happening here. Everybody else can see the passion, the fire, and the excitement in Moses' face. They can see the fire that drives Moses but Moses cannot see it. In fact, he is not even aware, because sometimes that is what happens. When the Spirit of God captures you, you cannot even see what the Spirit of God is doing in your life. And so, as he descends, people are amazed, there's fear, because they see his face on fire, but Moses is not even aware that his face is, is on fire. Sometimes when we have caught something of the glory of God, we do not see it ourselves, but those around us see the radiance, the fire, or the shine in us, and they know that we have a power or strength which is beyond ourselves. I think one can see this sort of effect on people who have experienced the joy and peace of knowing God in their lives. Have you met somebody who knows the joy and the peace of knowing God in their life? You know those kinds of people who are so hopeful that even when everything around them says you need to give up, they hold on to the hope because they know that God is with them. I have seen this as a minister when I visit people in hospital. I've seen it when the family phones me and says to me, can you please come? Our loved one is about uh, to die. That's how they put it, you know. 
saying, no, please come. We, we do not know what to do. The doctors have told us that they're going to switch off the machines. And when I get into the hospital room, and I look at the person that everybody else is worried about, they, they, they are just in a state of peace and calmness. And that is the type of radiance that we sometimes see. People who are dying and who have come to terms with the fact that they are dying, it shows on their, fa on their faces a peace and a calm which is absent from others, most of the time from those who love them and from those who care about them. Now, although the radiance, the fire, the shine, and the glow from the face of Moses frightened the people, he speaks the words of God. He continues to speak the words of God. He speaks the word that God had given him. And then after speaking, he then puts on a veil. But there's something about the veil. The veil does not come before he speaks. So he speaks what God had asked him to, to say to the people. And only after speaking that which God had commanded him to speak, then he puts on the veil. And I think there is something about the light of God in our lives. That one of the things that we should never do about the light of God in our lives is to conceal it before other people. It is to hide it. And so Moses does not hide his face before people can see that his face is on fire. He goes to them, terrified as they are, he goes to them and he speaks to them what God wants them to, to hear. Is this not why Jesus says you cannot take a lamp and put it under the table? Because the light of God needs to be seen. And so Moses understood this, so he goes to them with this funny face, this face on fire, and he speaks to them the things of God. And when the will of God is done, he goes there and he puts on a veil to cover his face. Now the question could be, why then did he wear the veil after speaking to the people, even when he knows that they are afraid? I think the answer is simple. The people needed to see that his face was on fire. The people needed to see the glory of God. The people needed to see the radiant face. The people needed to know that Moses had been with God. Now, this story reinforces the importance of Moses as the human being called by God to act as a mediator of the revelation at Mount Sinai and to speak the ongoing messages from God. If we take today's reading as the restoration of the law, if we understand what is happening in these few verses that we have read as the restoration of the law, if we understand what is happening here as a gift of another set of tablets to guide the people, then we can see from this story that our God is a gracious and a loving God, that God is yet again reaching out to people, that God is yet again offering them a covenant relationship despite their initial lack of faith and their attempts to form a God that was less dangerous and more controllable. So when they were busy carving this golden calf, that was their attempt to build a God that they can control, a God that was less dangerous, a God that does not call them to do specific things. You remember what God did. God says to them, if you are going to be my people, then you need to do this. And so because they did not want they did not understand that at the center of covenant and at the center of every relationship is this thing of give and take. And so they did not want to understand why would God expect them to do certain things 
And so they did not want a demanding God. They wanted a God that they can control, a God that they can take and put somewhere on a stand and say, that is where you belong, and that God will sit there and not interfere in other aspects of their lives. Even when they do that, and with God knowing that that is what they were doing, God offers them another chance. God reveals God's self to them. And God invites them into a relationship with God. And God reminds them that God loves them and that God cares for them. And that God does not count. It is not God who recalls that they, they did something with the golden calf. God does not even count it. He doesn't even tell them. Because that is the nature of our God. And so in this covenant service, in this covenant Sunday, I do not know. Maybe you have a golden calf somewhere that you have carved for yourself. A God that you can control and manage. A lesser demanding God. Maybe there are other ways in which you have been faithful in your covenant relationship with God. I don't know. But what I do know is that God invites you this morning. God invites you to enter into this covenant relationship as a new person. God offers you another opportunity to give it another try to give it another go. And God says to you, just as you are, I welcome you. You can come into a relationship with me. And so I do not know what is your, what are some of the things that you would want to put before God as part of the covenant relationship. But last week we, we gave you slips. Does this look familiar? Last week we, we gave you slips. And the slip has got five things which we refer to as membership commitments. These are not demands, these are just commitments. These are things that can help all of us to grow in our relationship with God. These are some of the smaller things that can help us to check uh, our relationship with God. And so there are five things that we ask you to go and think about. Now one of the things that happened or happened with Moses is that for 40 days and 40 nights, he was in a deep conversation with God. And so the radiant face that we see, or the fire in his face, is a result of the deep conversations that he's been having with God. And so we're going to invite you now, uh, for those of you who did uh, receive these slips last week, and hopefully during the course of the last week, you were in deep conversations with God about some of these commitments and that you have filled your sleep, and that you are ready to, to bring it forward. And so we're going to open that opportunity for you to bring the sleep forward. But for those of us who were not here last week for whatever reason, we've got tables on both sides uh, of the sanctuary. So if you look to my left, there are two tables there, and if you look to my right, there are also two tables there where you can get these slips. And so we just want to invite you that as we renew our covenant, that you, you make commitments, especially in those five areas that are, that are on that slip. And for some of us who prefer things to, to be more private, we have also provided envelopes for you. So you can write whatever commitments that you want to make, and you can put your commitment slip in an envelope and then you can just come forward and place it on the basket as you feel led. And so we're going to have some music playing. 
And then for the next few, few moments, I invite us to prayerfully bring our slaves to the front. Invited through this invitation. Commit yourselves to Christ as his servants. Give yourselves to him that you may belong to him. Christ has many services to be done. Some are more easy and honorable. Others are more difficult and disgraceful. Some are suitable to our inclinations and interests. Others are contrary to both. In some, we may please Christ and please ourselves. But then there are other works where we cannot please Christ except by denying ourselves. It is necessary, therefore, that we consider what it means to be a servant of Christ. Let us, therefore, go to Christ and pray. I now invite us to stand. And we together say that prayer there, the portion which is written in yellow. Let me be your servant under your command. I will no longer be my own. I will give up myself to your will in all things. Be satisfied that Christ shall give you your place and work. suffering. Let me be employed for you, or laid aside for you, exalted for you, or got low for you. Let me be full, let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I pray you now. 